All right. Uh, I think uh, we can get started now. So, um, first of all, everyone, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our data seminar series, uh, these are recorded. Uh, so um, I just want to remind everyone of that, that this is uh, this uh, talk and, and the subsequent conversation is going to be recorded and posted um, on our data seminar um, channel. So it's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker this week, Aurelie Edelin. Um, I first learned of Aurelie's work uh, at the Monterey Data Conference um, in August last year. Um, and ever since then, uh, we've been trying to find a, a time uh, that will work for her to come and tell us more about it. So I'm delighted that we've been able to arrange her to come and um, tell us more about her work with uh, particle accelerators and the control of particle accelerators in your networks. So Aurelie is uh, a Pnofsky Fellow um, at Slack National Accelerator Lab. Uh, she did her graduate work at Fermi National Accelerator Lab, um, applying neural network based approaches to particle accelerators and she's continued and extended that work at Slack, um, developing machine learning based approaches for the modeling and control of particle accelerators. So we're very happy to have her um, with us um, and looking forward to, to hearing more about more about your work, Ollie. please take it away. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um... So I am going to try to give you a relatively broad overview of um, recent developments in this space. Um, just recently in the past few years, uh, there's been much more interest in machine learning applications for particle accelerators in general. So um, there's a lot of work that uh, I, I won't cover here, um, but just know that there's, there's a wide variety of work going on. Um, so, um, for those who aren't familiar uh, with particle accelerators, um, there, there's actually quite a diverse um, uh, different types of accelerators uh, for different use cases. And each of these come with uh, fairly unique uh, control challenges as well. So we have um, some machines that are quite flexible. So for example, um, the Linux coherent light source at Slack um, serves a really wide variety of um, scientific users that come in to use the light that is produced. Um, and this requires really customizing that for each, um, each user. In contrast, um, there are other scientific uh, uh, use cases that really um, rely more on uh, kind of extremely stable steady state operation. So an example of this would be um, like this uh, fixed set of fixed target experiments at Fermilab, where the idea really is to try to maximize the number of protons uh, that are hitting a target to generate neutrinos per hour. Um, and then there are a variety of uh, small test facilities. Um, these are, are kind of scattered all over the place at universities and various national labs, uh, where the goal is to really um, test out new accelerator concepts um, and uh, do things like advanced manipulation techniques for the beam. Um, and then uh, we also um, have some work that's focused on sort of fundamentally more challenging to control um, accelerator technology. So uh, this includes things like trying to use plasmas to accelerate, um, accelerate beams. And then finally, um, there are a variety of industrial and medical use cases. Uh, so one example that um, I think is, is quite nice is, is proton therapy. So it turns out that um, you can actually target cancerous tumors much more precisely uh, with protons and even carbon because the way that they deposit energy um, is much more highly peaked um, in contrast to something like x-rays, which tend to uh, scatter, um, uh, scatter uh, the, depo the deposited energy around. Um, it's a little bit harder to, to really accurately target a tumor. So in that case, if you um, can then get really fine control um, over the beam position and energy, you could potentially um, do a better job of, of uh, cancer therapy. Um, so just to uh, give a little bit more um, quantitative detail on uh, the kind of tuning challenges that you have uh, at, a, at a really flexible accelerator like the LCLS, um, we're really uh, trying to support a huge variety of experiments ranging from trying to understand matter in extreme conditions to trying to understand natural processes like photosynthesis. And um, we support a lot of different user experiments. So uh, in 2016, it was around 1,000. Um, and then uh, it, typically, um, every single experiment has a different need as far as the 
um, X-ray wavelength, uh, the beam pulse duration, et cetera. Um, and the way that we achieve uh, those target beam characteristics for the users is by adjusting a variety of machine settings. So I'm only showing um, a very small subset here, but ultimately it ends up being dozens to hundreds of parameters um, that can potentially be tuned. Um, and typically we're trying to uh, produce quite different um, uh, electron beam shapes uh, in phase space. So I'm showing three examples of uh, different time energy correlations that you might get um, on the beam at LCLS. And uh, to do this, we actually spend uh, quite a lot of time um, adjusting uh, the accelerator settings uh, to, um, fac uh, to facilitate the needs for these experiments. Um, and to put some numbers on this, uh, if you try to attach some value uh, to, to how much um, the number of um, uh, hours that we spend tuning is, uh, you can see that if we are um, running uh, about 5,000 hours of experiment delivery per year, and we have an annual budget of $145 million, this means it's about $30,000 per experiment hour to run the machine. And so the 400 hours that we spent hand tuning has about a $12 million equivalent value is one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is that um, we could fit in 10 additional experiments in that time. Um, so what this really means is that uh, for machines like this, it's very important um, to make tuning very efficient uh, in order to maximize the scientific output of the facility per dollar spent. Um, and then it also, um, is related to uh, the fact that bringing uh, fundamentally new um, operating conditions um, uh, to the users is also um, is also challenging. So, for example, uh, for some of the more extreme um, setups that we we have, like trying to produce out of second pulses, um, actually commissioning those configurations in the first place can be quite difficult and, and involve uh, really extensive tuning. So um, why why is this uh, so difficult? Um, if you know we we had some very fast accurate model of the machine, presumably we could um, do offline um, optimization of the model and then put those settings onto the machine, and we would get the beam that we wanted. Um, but unfortunately, nothing's ever that simple. Um, we have lots of sources of um, uh, fluctuations on the machine. So for example, the initial laser that produces the electron beam can fluctuate. Um, there's sometimes uh, drifts that we don't really uh, understand the source of, but can observe. Um, and so sometimes it's very difficult to chase, uh, chase down on sources of this kind of drift. Um, we also have uh, a lot of small compounding sources of uncertainty. For example, a, a field map for a um, uh, an accelerator component might not be exactly correct. So we often have large gaps between um, the observed system behavior and our simulations. And then in some cases, um, we're relying on fundamentally uh, nonlinear effects um, with the uh, free electron laser at LCLS, for instance, that the basic operating principle of that um, fundamentally relies on a nonlinear instability. So in practice, we end up relying really heavily on human operators to control uh, the machine. And when you talk to operators about the process that they're using, they're really doing a lot of um, kind of sophisticated model learning, combining physics understanding with um, observed behavior of the machine. Sometimes they're doing iterative fine tuning, uh, sort of equivalent to local feedback. They're doing all kinds of complicated diagnostic analysis, looking at beam images and time series. And they're also kind of getting a feel for how to tweak things. So they're learning, in effect, these heuristic control policies that they then use uh, to help tune. Um, but this is an exceptionally hard problem overall. So you're typically uh, only focusing on one small part of the accelerator at a time. Uh, for example, we tend to um, tune uh, the injector upstream part of the accelerator separately uh, from the main uh, LINAC and separately from at LCLS the, the, um, the undulator that produces uh, the photon beam. And we kind of know from experience that uh, this is actually a suboptimal way to tune. Um, so in, uh, in simulation, uh, it's been shown uh, that if you do start to end 
uh, i.e. looking at the entire accelerator op optimization of the machine, you wind up with um, better solutions here shown in this uh, red um, trade-off curve between these two parameters. Um, then you would get if you uh, first uh, tune one section of the machine and then use that optimal beam as input to the next section of the machine shown in green here. So this hints that you know we might be able to actually get fundamentally higher beam quality if we're tuning on um, uh, parameters across the entire accelerator. Um, so in, in essence, the, the overarching goal um, combines a, a few different questions. So um, one of these is, can we actually use machine learning to aid uh, optimization so that we can um, do faster tuning, but also higher quality tuning? Um, can this open up new capabilities potentially if we can push these machines into operating states that we would not have been able to before? Um, and then um, because in accelerators, we do have reasonably good physics models, um, can we kind of inject that into some of these machine learning approaches? And then on the other side of that, can we actually use machine learning to extract um, new uh, physics information about what's going on in the machine? Okay, so um, back to the, the overall tuning problem, um, there's sort of a range of ways that one can start to, to think about controlling a, a large machine like this. So, so one is to simply assume that you, you aren't going to be able to learn anything um, systematic about the machine, in which case uh, you could do um, some model-free optimization um, and hopefully uh, find a method to do this for many parameters simultaneously. You could also try to build um, uh, more expressive, uh, better um, global machine models. So this this relies on the assumption that you you think you it's possible to to build such a model. You have all the information available at your disposal that's needed for that. If you could find a way to to, to actually incorporate it into what you're doing, and then in the middle um, you have uh, this sort of um, in between space where uh, maybe it's useful to learn a representation of what's going on in the machine as you're doing a search in parameter space. And I'll talk about each of these. And um, for those of you who are familiar with um, optimization and, and such, uh, th these are just some examples of um, where some common techniques might fit into this framework. Um, so we know from experience, um, actually, that uh, it is possible to tune many, many parameters simultaneously on the machine. Um, uh, using methods um, that scale well with the number of parameters. Um, but unfortunately, some of these can be very slow to converge uh, and can actually get stuck in local minima easily. And I'll talk about a workaround for this later on. So that's on the one extreme. On the other extreme, uh, we do have good accelerator simulations. And with some work, these can be made to match uh, the accelerator well in some cases. Um, but generally, uh, this is extremely computationally intensive uh, to do. Uh, so for example, this is just one run uh, at LCLS, and it took um, uh, tens of hours on thousands of cores at NERSC. Um, and uh, this is, this, what this means is that we can't actually use um, this kind of simulation online with the machine. And it also really um, is, is prohibitive in trying to do sort of offline uh, experiment design ahead of time. Uh, there are some approaches uh, that still use the physics simulation uh, to try to um, get, get towards faster execution speeds. So for example, um, there are folks who have taken um, uh, particle accelerator simulations and made them uh, into GPU accelerated versions and then used those online. Um, but in general, uh, the execution speed is still uh, somewhat limited. You're talking about seconds to minutes still. Um, it's not the case that every, everywhere has uh, the necessary HPC resources available on site. Um, and then this also sort of sidesteps the fact that uh, it's actually extremely difficult and labor intensive oftentimes to get um, a simulation to actually match the machine behavior. And then once you've done that, things will still drift. Um, so you have to ha have a kind of constant process to update that. So a complementary approach that we've been looking at for a while now um, is to instead use um, machine learning based models to 
uh, augment um, the physics simulations that we have. So uh, we found um, that we can get significant speed up um, in simulations uh, just by training things like a, a simple neural net uh, on the input and output data. Um, and we've started extending this uh, to uh, sort of larger scale systems like the LCLS. So uh, this is an example where we're predicting uh, the longitudinal phase space measured at this transverse deflecting cavity uh, while changing a really wide variety of um, upstream machine settings uh, um, over basically their entire operating range. So this, this is still somewhat limited um, to, do, to do this for the full simulation, you would need to include many more parameters, but this is a nice step. Um, and what this really means is that, you know, instead of having to run on NERSC, we can now run on a laptop or uh, put this um, onto uh, the control system computers and run it there, which we're also starting to do. So we're uh, incorporating some of these um, models into um, GUIs that can actually talk to the overarching control system um, and read back parameters from the control system uh, and give an operator um, a, uh, you know, an interface with which to play around with different potential settings. So um, that, that sort of addresses this question of, can we speed up some, some of our models and put them on the machine? Um, but it doesn't answer the question of, is it a good idea to use those models? Um, uh, in optimization. And fundamentally, the problem here is that um, as soon as you are uh, optimizing, you're moving, you're potentially moving outside of the uh, training distribution that you had for that model. So we wanted to see um, how reliable uh, we, how reliable our models were in practice for, um, for using with optimization. Um, so we tried this on um, uh, an injector setup. So this is a pretty uh, nonlinear um, part of the accelerator. It's at low energy, so the beam cell fields are pretty important. Um, and we ran um, just sort of a, a genetic uh, algorithm um, on the, uh, the, the accelerator physics simulation. And this is commonly done for, for like design. Um, and for um, finding good machine working points. So it was, it was a natural um, uh, optimization algorithm to pick to compare against. Um, and then we trained um, a machine learning model uh, based on a random sample of the input variables and ran a genetic algorithm on that model as well. And then compared uh, the resulting Pareto front um, uh, trade-offs, which show just the optimal trade-off between these two parameters. Um, and then, we took the Pareto front uh, that we obtained from the neural net model and put it back through the physics simulation um, to see uh, how good uh, the prediction was. Uh, it turned out it matched pretty well uh, for a variety of the fronts that we were looking at. Um, and uh, this also ended up being faster um, in initial optimization as well. So uh, this points to the fact that this might be useful for um, uh, uh, trying to speed up initial optimization. Uh, in addition to being a way to just encapsulate a, a, a fast executing physics simulation. Um, I'm going to skip this uh, just because I think um, I want to make good use of time, but um, uh, we also have tried this on, on a, different, a different system as well. Um, and there's a, a paper uh, that I've pointed to uh, that you can check out if you're interested. So we had this question, um, can, we, can we do the same sort of thing on a live accelerator? Um, so we went down to uh, UCLA uh, to their Pegasus beamline, and we tried to do this um, kind of approach uh, just with measured data from the machine. Um, and we uh, decided to tackle this round of flat beam transform problem. So the goal is to take a round uh, beam coming off of uh, the cathode and to turn it into a flat beam. Um, and this is uh, actually quite a challenging problem um, because of all of the uh, nonlinearities in the system. So we took um, a lot of measured data and basically trained a neural network to predict uh, the beam statistics from the screen. And then uh, we were reading um, inputs from the machine that we weren't going to change to get an idea of the present system state, and then ran a genetic algorithm on our neural net model while adjusting these three um, quadrupoles that are used uh, to transform the, as the main controllable settings to transform from the round of the flat beam. 
Um, and what you wind up with um, is actually a, a pretty reasonable flat beam when you do this procedure. Um, and we actually did this um, for, for a day after uh, the training, uh, training data um, when there was a little bit of distribution drift uh, in some of the inputs. And so the real punchline here is that instead of um, relying on hand tuning, which takes around 10 to 20 minutes, the neural net uh, very quickly um, in less than a minute is able to give some suggested settings uh, given drifting upstream settings, uh, up, upstream inputs rather, um, that, that get you close to this flat beam solution. And this is just showing some of the distribution drifts. Um, and we also tried this again um, five months later um, with similar kinds of distribution shifts, uh, and it still provided a, a decent initial guess. Um, so then even though the solution isn't perfect, you can still uh, fine tune with other optimizers. So we, we started with the, the guess from our neural net model, and then we used um, a local tuning algorithm, um, a Gaussian process uh, based Bayesian optimization algorithm, um, and then hand tuning. And um, this uh, sped up, starting with the neural net guess, sped up um, the convergence for all of these uh, other methods. Uh, we also did a little bit of work to see whether the neural net had actually learned anything sensible. Um, so we, we just wanted to make sure that even though we gave it a, a noisy training set, um, that some of the sort of smooth behavior that you expect to see when you're varying, uh, in this case, we just two parameters of interest, uh, that you get something that looks roughly like what you would get in the simulation. And you can kind of see uh, it's qualitatively similar and that you have some maximum point here and a minimum point here, and you see sort of similar behavior with the neural net model. So um, where, where we're headed now is actually um, sort of trying to combine these two things. So um, this I'm showing a, a slide from older work where we uh, tried to take um, some simulation data, train a neural net, and then just update that with um, kind of a smaller amount of measured data. and. Um, we were able to uh, get pretty good agreement between measurements um, uh, you do, doing it this way. And the appeal here is, re is really just that you would be able to get away with less measured data potentially. And also you would still have a model that's representative um, in regions of parameter space that haven't been visited by the machine directly. Um, and this is something that we're now um, trying to scale up and do uh, more robustly. Um, for LCLS and FACET2 and a, num a number of other uh, accelerators that we're collaborating with. Um, related to this, um, there's this question of um, if you've trained a, a model, especially on um, a bunch of historical archive data from an accelerator, can you actually then use uh, sensitivities that have been learned by the model um, uh, to, to find out new things about, about your machine, um, which you could then potentially use uh, to help, um, help control the machine better. And um, this is a question that um, actually was looked into a little bit um, by folks at Spear 3, um, also at Slack, uh, where um, they have this uh, drift in the injection efficiency over time. And uh, it wasn't really clear what the source of this was. And they, they often are chasing this around by um, kind of retuning uh, the orbit feedback settings to compensate for this. So um, what they did was train a neural net over a few years of archive data um, and then uh, looked at the sensitivities to various inputs. And they found that there was actually a really strong correlation with um, a ground temperature sensor uh, in the parking lot um, outside of Spear 3. And in, in retrospect, this kind of makes sense because the the actual temperature um, control inside um, the accelerator enclosure isn't actually that good. And so you'll get expansion and contraction of uh, the entire machine, which then, you know, would lead you to need to readjust um, the steering set points uh, to, to maintain good performance. So the, the idea here now is that this could potentially um, be a way to do an initial, take an initial guess at what the um, orbit feedback settings should be uh, as a function of this ground temperature sensor reading, which could save time rather than just kind of um, manually retuning um, the orbit feedback settings. So, so far, um, everything that I talked about 
um, involved uh, forward modeling where we have some settings and possibly some input diagnostics like a, 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 some, some information about the laser um, upstream, uh, predicting some output diagnostics um, that are measurements of the beam that we care about, and then using that you know, with an optimizer uh, to, to try to um, get, get a good uh, set of settings. Um, but uh, in fact, uh, you can kind of skip these steps a little bit if you um, instead uh, try to develop an inverse model. Um, so the idea here is that if you have some desired output beam characteristics um, and you have some um, uh, uh, other uh, things that indicate what the machine's state is otherwise that you don't want to control. So this could be settings that you don't want to touch or um, input diagnostics that you have no control over. Uh, you can then map those to predicted um, optimal uh, settings that should get you close to your desired beam output. And this is pretty appealing um, for accelerators for a lot of reasons. I mean, one is just the high dimensionality, but another is that we also have a lot of these image-based diagnostics where um, it would be really nice to use something like a neural net to look directly um, at this image and then, you know, either use that in um, uh, use, use that to give an initial uh, setting guess um, to, to get to that target phase space or to use it actually just in a, a control policy, which I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, but just in this first case, uh, we, we actually tested this out a couple of years ago um, in, in kind of a preliminary study at LCLS. So there um, we have a specific uh, target longitudinal phase space that, that we want to achieve um, at the transverse deflecting cavity. And so um, what we did was just uh, took uh, some, some data from um, the machine and then trained an inverse model to give uh, the suggested settings um, for two settings on the machine that speak very strongly to the longitudinal phase space. And then um, we used a local optimizer uh, to kind of fine tune that solution afterward. And so uh, the, the result essentially was that we we, we messed up the beam phase space, we gave it this target, and when we tried to use just the local optimizer, it was not able to converge in the end. Uh, but when we gave it the initial guess from the neural network, it was able to converge pretty closely uh, to the target the longitudinal phase space. So this is um, kind of a nice example of combining sort of the two um, opposite ends of this uh, um, uh, spectrum of, of ways of tackling the problem that I suggested earlier. We're combining global modeling with model-free optimization. Um, moving more towards this, um, this middle, um, middle approach where you're kind of trying to learn a model as you go or learn a control policy as you go. Um, I, I'll, I'll speak more about this and I think this is um, a major area that we want to keep pushing on in the future. So um, a, a method that uh, we've used pretty successfully in accelerators now um, at a couple of places is Bayesian optimization, and in particular Bayesian optimization with Gaussian processes. Um, oops. So the, the idea here is that um, you learn a model that has some uh, associated uncertainty estimate with it, and then you use that uncertainty along with the model prediction to help you select the next point to sample. And uh, this way, you're iteratively updating the model as you search. Um, and so at LCLS, um, uh, this has uh, been demonstrated um, on the problem of trying to adjust uh, focusing magnets to maximize X-ray pulse energy. This was an effort led by Joe Duris. Um, and the, the main result was that uh, when uh, we, we apply GP-based Bayesian optimization, we get um, substantially faster um, and higher quality uh, X-ray pulse energy output than when we use a standard optimizer like Nelder Mead simplex. And then further, um, there are actually kind of expected correlations um, uh, between um, adjacent input parameters and the X-ray pulse energy. And one nice thing about Gaussian process models is that you can actually kind of bake these uh, expected correlations into the kernel. And when you do this, um, for the same data points, you actually uh, learn a much better representation of the underlying ground truth. Um, and so uh, this was done um, for, for LCLS um, on this problem. And indeed, uh, you, get to, you get substantially faster convergence this way. 
Um, and in both cases, it's still faster than the standard optimizer. Um, another extension of this is to actually uh, try to include safety constraints. So the idea here is that um, you actually have additional uh, requirements other than just wanting to maximize the FEL pulse energy. Uh, you don't want it to um, have an intermittent dropout, for example. Uh, the users will not like this. And in some cases, especially for high power machines, you don't want the beam losses to go above a certain threshold because you can damage components. Um, and so uh, there was a group at um, uh, um, ETH Zerk um, who demonstrated this on the Swiss free electron laser um, at PSI. And here, uh, what they did was include safety constraints for the intermittent dropouts um, in their Gaussian process optimizer. Um, and they also um, combined this with um, an efficient uh, search um, in order to scale this up to, I think they used around 40 um, tu tuning parameters. Um, so here, what you're seeing is that when they don't have safety constraints, there are a lot more intermittent dropouts um, in FEL pulse energy. But when they include the safety constraints, it actually um, prevents uh, uh, those dropouts from, from happening. It prevents the algorithm from exploring regions of parameter space where those dropouts are likely to happen. Um, so moving um, away from uh, Gaussian processes and Bayesian optimization, um, you can also uh, start to think about um, taking a similar kind of approach, but with a neural network. So if you have um, a neural network control policy, uh, basically what you're doing is taking some measurement of the system uh, state and then uh, making setting changes on the machine, and then you'll get some feedback. And this is um, a, a common um, paradigm that, that this is applicable to is reinforcement learning. Um, and so uh, the idea is that because you're using a neural network, you could potentially scale this up to many more parameters um, than you could with a Gaussian process, for instance, um, at least in its basic form. Um, and you might be able to look directly um, at uh, image diagnostics to use as, as part of the inputs. Um, and so we actually tried this out um, on the, the flat beam problem I described um, uh, at Pegasus earlier. Um, and this machine is very noisy. So I'm actually in this video just showing seven um, iterations of the algorithm. And it converged um, to a similar uh, solution that the Gaussian process optimizer did in this case. This again is, is a, a low dimensional problem. So this was kind of a preliminary test, but there's a lot of um, a lot of work going on throughout the accelerator community to try to apply reinforcement learning with neural nets to a variety of different kinds of accelerator systems. It's something that we're interested in pursuing more at LCLS. Okay, so um, the, the last um, bit uh, that I wanted to talk about actually doesn't relate to control as directly, but um, it's still extremely uh, important. Um, so, and, and this is the fact that in order to actually control the accelerator well, you have to have um, good measurements um, of the beam. And sometimes this is actually quite difficult. So we have some diagnostics that we can't use continuously during operation because they actually destroy the beam that would need to be propagated onto the users. Um, some of our diagnostics are also not sensitive in the entire operating range. And then um, some of them also have a slower update rate than desired. So um, we may have some signals that we can get um, at, a, at beam rate. And then for some of our more complicated diagnostics, uh, it might update significantly more slowly than that. And then at smaller accelerators, um, there's sometimes this issue where um, you, you, uh, you actually might only have one uh, one of these measurement devices that you actually have to physically move to different parts of the beam line, in which case you've lost your ability to measure um, at both at, at, um, at both places. So um, in principle, if you have some kind of fast model, you can take measurements that are always available from the machine and come up with a diagnostic prediction that would mirrors the diagnostic measurement that you cannot take at that moment. 
Um, and you can use a physics simulation um, if that is, is fast enough and accurate enough. Um, to put a, a concrete example on this, um, this is uh, showing a, a beamline at Fermilab where uh, you actually have to physically insert a mask uh, into the beamline. Um, and then uh, you, you can measure the transverse phase space uh, by seeing um, uh, how the beam spreads out um, and doing some fits to that uh, as measured on a, um, on, a, on a screen that's put downstream in the beam. So if everything upstream is sufficiently stable enough and you've um, trained a model um, on a wide range of settings here, uh, you could potentially just use a machine learning model to predict what's going on in this part of the machine. And then you don't need to insert uh, this measurement device um, uh, in order to get an estimate of the transverse phase space at that point in the, in the accelerator. And so um, this actually can work quite well, um, even for a complicated diagnostic where uh, you have lots of fine structure um, that you would need to predict. And then um, more recently, um, the, a major area where this is being applied is to the longitudinal phase space. Um, and this, uh, this is um, something that can be attacked in a variety of ways. So th there was an older study that um, tried to fill in, um, uh, fill in information on shots uh, where uh, the longitudinal phase space diagnostic was um, uh, still, still updating. So this is filling in for, for a slow measurement. And they used um, a variety of different um, uh, electron and photon beam settings and diagnostics uh, to help aid this prediction. Uh, this is just showing the, um, the spectrum um, coming out of the photon beam against some measurements and some predictions. Um, a, a related approach that was demonstrated at FACET um, a few years ago was to um, actually take a very simple simulation that we don't expect to match the machine very well, um, and then um, adaptively tune that uh, with um, uh, ba based on measurements from a, a diagnostic that's always available. So in this case, it was um, uh, the, the SIAG um, diagnostic that uh, was then used to help tune this model online to then predict the, um, the longitudinal phase space directly. Um, so you can see here that the agreement is quite good. Um, and then um, what we've been working on more recently is, is actually just trying to take um, machine uh, settings and in some cases um, other diagnostic information and use that to predict the longitudinal phase space with a neural network. Um, so this also um, has been demonstrated experimentally. Uh, at this time we, we had done it on LCLS, but the plan is to uh, keep working on this and um, get it fully implemented for, for FASTIT too. So um, in each of these cases, uh, these are not really um, used um, in regular operation yet. Um, there's still some development that's needed to, to make sure that they're robust enough. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, about that uh, in a few minutes. Um, another piece of the puzzle here is that um, we, we also want to be able to actually extract useful information um, from these really uh, complicated high dimensional signals. Um, and this is an area where um, there's been some work on trying to use machine learning in various ways to do this. So I'll just go through one example. Um, this is for, um, again, LCLS with the XTCAV. Um, the idea here is that uh, when you don't have uh, the FEL process going on, um, you can take an image um, of the beam. And then when uh, lasing is occurring, uh, you actually lose um, energy from the electrons uh, as they give it up to the photon beam. And so you get these um, uh, vertical streaks in this diagnostic. And in practice, this is actually used uh, to try to infer um, information about the photon beam that isn't directly measured. And um, in principle, uh, you could do this with a neural network instead of kind of the iterative reconstruction method that we use at present. So the, the present method relies on a number of assumptions, including that you're only looking at vertical slices at once, which starts to break down um, as you uh, get into the so-called saturation regime where some of these um, uh, spikes start to, to have an angle to them. 
Um, and uh, what uh, um, a grad student that we were working with found was that um, you actually can predict uh, the X-ray power profile quite well uh, if you use uh, neural net instead of using the iterative reconstruction method. Um, and it's much faster as well. Um, so this was uh, a kind of a, a fun, exciting result. Um, and in principle, this could be applied to a variety of other uh, diagnostics uh, um, that we use on accelerators. OK, so I talked a little bit about um, just uh, some initial studies that uh, sort of point direction, point to directions where we're going in um, uh, as we, we try to do uh, more system-wide control of accelerators. So we have examples where we were able to do faster system optimization. We're um, trying to get um, faster, more accurate machine models uh, that we could potentially use online uh, to aid in aid tuning. Um, and then we're also trying to extract more information um, from the accelerator, whether it's predicting an output diagnostic or trying to improve um, kind of on the fly analysis uh, of these diagnostics. And then um, lastly, uh, we're trying to use uh, machine learning to try to facilitate some improved understanding of the machines. So this includes things like trying to pull out sensitivities that we might then be able to exploit and control that could otherwise go unnoticed. Um, however, uh, there are an awful lot of open questions that uh, we are still trying to address. A big one is the question of robustness and model uncertainty. Um, so in accelerators, uh, we, we usually have quite a lot of drift in the machine. We have parts that are being replaced all the time. Um, it's, it's really not uh, one accelerator. It's uh, an accelerator that's sort of similar day to day, but ultimately is changing over time. And so um, particularly for um, the, the neural net based methods that we're trying to use, um, uh, we really uh, need to include um, predictive uncertainties. Um, so the, the, this kind of cute cartoon is just showing that um, uh, when you don't know um, what you don't know, uh, you can make very confident um, uh, stupid decisions. Um, and then uh, as you add in awareness of what you don't know, uh, you can hopefully uh, exploit um, that information to either fill in the parameter space more or just switch to um, kind of more um, uh, uh, conventional forms of, of doing online prediction or online control when you're in those regions where the uncertainty estimate is high. Um, so that, that's uh, extremely important for, for basically all of the applications that I talked about. Um, and so, I mean, there are a variety of ways of doing this. Uh, you can ensemble sets of neural nets together. Um, we're looking into Bayesian neural nets uh, at the moment um, and trying to see if that, that's a potential uh, route for us. Um, there's also uh, related to that, this, this question of how do you um, retrain uh, these models online in a reliable fashion. Um, so for machines where, th where things aren't changing very often or changing very quickly, this is less of an issue, but for particularly for machines where you're constantly trying to change um, the operating conditions, this is a big problem. Um, another one is how best to make use of diverse data sources. So um, the biggest one for us is uh, trying to combine data from simulation and the machine. Um, so how do you how do you evaluate um, you know uh, how do how do um, which one to trust when they give you conflicting answers and how do you incorporate those in a seamless way into some of these models? And um, another big one is uh, scaling to higher dimension. Um, as I said, one of the the goals for all of this is to do uh, kind of larger scale start to end system control. And so far, we've been demoing stuff on. Um, much smaller scale systems and, and accelerator subsystems. So this is a big open area. Um, and even for things like generating surrogate models from simulation, how to um, adaptively sample the parameter space to maximize information gain per point is a big open question. Um, and then we're also working on um, combining the strengths of different methods. So uh, GP-based Bayesian optimization really excels when um, you don't have 
like a lot of uh, previous data that you can use. Um, uh, whereas uh, neural nets perform really well in this kind of high data regime, but uh, really, it's really difficult to get an accurate model when you, when you don't have very much data. And then it's also hard to get a reliable uncertainty estimate. So combining these things and doing neural network based Bayesian optimization, this kind of thing is another area that we're, we're actively pursuing at the moment. Um, and then uh, this last uh, open question about, you know, how best to include or extract physics information is another big one. So we have some early examples of that, but um, we haven't uh, really fully delved into that yet, I would say, in this community. Um, and aside from that, uh, everything that I talked about so far um, involves basically single time step input, single time step output data. Um, but really, uh, there are some systems in accelerators where you have to take into account the time evolution of the system as you're doing control. So this includes things like uh, cryogenic system control and um, control over uh, things like the resonant frequency of RF cavities. Um, anything that involves um, uh, system evolution on a rate that's slower than um, the rate at which you need to make uh, control settings um, requires taking into account the, that system evolution to be really efficient. Um, so for this, it's going to be pretty important for some of these um, upcoming um, accelerators that rely on superconducting technology. And um, a basic way of um, adjusting, of, of doing control in this, uh, in this, in this um, kind of situation is to develop a model that is capable of predicting rollouts of the, um, of the behavior of the system, and then running an optimizer around that, given um, your uh, estimate of the present system state, and then um, uh, trying to optimize uh, actions that can be taken in order to get um, uh, some desired uh, output uh, that you want um, in time. And um, then you repeat this as you go along. So this is, this is model predictive control. And there, there's some relationships to reinforcement learning as well. For instance, in reinforcement learning, you're just learning a map uh, in some cases to the optimal action rather than running an optimizer. Um, but the, um, the takeaway is that we've, we've already applied this for um, a, kind of a simple um, system where there is a cooling, um, some cooling water that comes in uh, and is adjusted with a controllable valve. Um, and then it's used to control the resonant frequency of an RF cavity. And um, this is important because uh, the, um, uh, the resonant frequency needs to be uh, kept on target in order to accelerate the beam uh, to, to its uh, full energy efficiently. And so um, what you can see here is that if you ignore all of the transients in the system, um, and you just try to do simple feedback control, um, what you wind up with is a very large overshoot, uh, in this case, in the temperature. Um, and what this means is that uh, in these uh, cases where you're going far off resonance, you have to push more forward RF power into the system to compensate and keep the beam accelerated to the right energy. So it's also um, an, an energy expenditure that doesn't need to be there. And you can see it takes a, a while to actually um, settle uh, to the target in this case. Whereas if you use model predictive control uh, with a, a model that has been um, uh, trained on uh, data taken from the system and it's taking into account the behavior um, of the system as a whole, uh, you wind up um, having a much faster convergence time um, and you lose uh, the large overshoot. Um, so this again was a, a preliminary study, but it's something that um, we, we want to try to apply um, in the future for controlling um, uh, potentially the cryo plant at LCLS2 uh, along with the superconducting RF cavities. Okay, so um, in summary, uh, we, we have um, a, kind of a lot of interesting uh, control challenges and accelerators. Uh, these are really complex nonlinear systems. Um, we also have a lot of um, individual subsystems um, that need to be controlled and that need to work together. Um, we have lots of interesting um, high dimensional diagnostics like images and spectra and time series. And then um, we have uh, not, not just a, a static problem, but uh, we have 
uh, basically a lot of drift over time and, and uh, things like part replacement. So um, there's change in the system over time. Um, and these are also uh, challenges uh, that kind of align in interesting ways with um, uh, machine learning research. Uh, so um, it's it's not just a it's not just one of these cases where we we can take um, methods that are fully developed in the ML community and apply them to the accelerator. This actually could be an interesting test bed to push forward some of those methods. Um, and then we also uh, have uh, pretty strong incentives for trying to improve system-wide uh, control of the accelerator. Um, we want to switch really quickly, oftentimes, between uh, highly customized um, uh, beam setups. Uh, we actually want to push beam quality um, uh, uh, to sort of unprecedented um, levels that we haven't been able to achieve before by exploiting um, a wider variety of controls on the machine. And then um, this also should, in principle, enable us to, to actually tune more finely. Um, and uh, lastly, this is not just for large scientific user facilities. Um, the, the sort of um, improvements that we can make uh, may also translate into kind of important um, industrial and medical use cases as well. And we think machine learning is going to be key uh, in this. So in, in closing, um, I'd just like to acknowledge that I showed um, work uh, that has involved a lot of people. Um, and so I've tried to get most of their names here. I apologize if I missed a few. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll end and happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much, Aurelie. That was really interesting. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to um, unmute uh, yourself and ask or raise your hand. I see that we have uh, one talk in the chat already. Um, Hungry, do you want to read, read your question, um, ask your question or? Uh... I can uh, um, uh, share it. So uh, one question is if in uncertainty quantification is a central issue, uh, why does model guided optimization like the Bayes optimization you mentioned, why is it not exclusively preferred over neural networks? Yeah, I'd say at, at the moment, um, in practice, it is preferred. Um, it's definitely what we've had the most practical success with and what's closest to being used in regular operation. Um, the major um, the major issue there is, is actually uh, scaling with number of training samples. So at a place like the LCLS, for instance, um, we have a huge machine archive um, that has data from when the machine has been in very different um, user requested operating states. And so um, actually trying to train something like a, a vanilla Gaussian process model on all of that data to then use in Gaussian process optimization um, is, is somewhat impractical. Um, this is something that we've, we've, tr we've tried looking at. Um, so there are actually approaches where um, you can try to increase um, the, the ability of Gaussian process models to handle um, like high dimensional cases like this. So some of them combine um, Bayesian neural net methods um, with Bayesian optimization. Some of them um, simply try to learn um, kind of a higher dimensional kernel by tacking a neural net on top of a Gaussian process model. Um, so I, I'd say um, right now, uh, in answer to your question, that dimensionality is the main perceived limitation. And it's something that we're working on trying to resolve. And in practice, like as far as actually stuff that's been used in regular operation, um, uh, GP-based Bayesian optimization is definitely kind of the most ready to go out of all of the approaches that I mentioned. Great, thank you. Um, I see David has uh, his hand up. Maybe go to David and um, maybe come back to some of the other chat questions afterwards. David, you want to go ahead? Yeah, uh, Orly, this is a really, really awesome talk. Um, uh, so thank you. And um, I want to. I have a question about custom beams, but uh, I wanted to first say that you know NERSC really speaks the language of science per dollar too, and so um, wherever um, you know 
wherever if if uh, simulations rather than reduced order models can be are are part of that, you know, let's do the calculus of of where where it fits. Um, and the um, the the notion of uh, of custom beams. I, I'm I'm wondering whether or not you could um, basically put a a you know a price estimate, you know, or a you know a t a t whether that's in in time or in other ways. Uh, whereby you know a, a science team could propose that they'd like uh, light or electrons to behave in a certain way, and that you could describe for them how uh, how difficult that is, if there's a, kind of a metric for that. Yeah, so that that's um, an interesting question, and it's kind of a tough one to answer. Um, in in practice, for some of the new new operating modes um, that users um, have asked for, some of those have taken many, many machine shifts to put together um, and, and fully bring into operation just with kind of hand tuning and, and sort of um, uh, some initial exploration in simulation. But again, you're somewhat prohibited prohibited um, by the, the actual speed of the simulations in that case. Um, the, lo looking at sort of the, the 30K um, Per hour number, if you consider um, that uh, sometimes these are taking many, you know, eight-hour shifts over uh, several months, um, uh, you can imagine that 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 starts to become quite costly. Um, and in, in contrast, if you have um, instead used uh, some of these ML methods to just run a bunch of simulations on NERSC, for example, I think we actually did some calculation um, for one of our surrogate models where we tried to get an estimate of the equivalent time that it took us to run the number of simula simulations we needed um, in order to uh, actually produce the surrogate model that we could then use more directly in optimization. Um, that I think it was it was something ridiculous, uh, ridiculously small. It was like two hundred dollars or something um, in equivalent um, operating time. Uh, uh, as far as you know, just trying to run those simulations in parallel on MERS. Um and then it, it's kind of there's no I think there's no direct case that we have right now where we can say like oh in this case we used a neural net surrogate model that we generated from massively parallel simulations on NERSC and that sped up the commissioning time for this new operating mode so that we saved, you know, this this other amount of machine time and here's the difference in dollar amount. We don't really have that. Um, but it's, it's certainly interesting to think about. I think that um, fundamentally uh, trying to, to develop better tools for the offline planning of these setups and then coupling those with better online optimization um, is, is going to save like quite a lot of, of time in the in the operating budget. Um, so I know that doesn't give you like a, a direct answer, but hopefully it gives you some of the gist of the way that we've at least been thinking about this as far as cost benefit analysis of the overhead that gets put into um, uh, using some of these tools versus just doing things the old way. Yeah, yeah, that, that does help. And uh, I take the fact that simulation is too slow to keep up as a, as a challenge. So thanks. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, so we've actually come to uh, one o'clock uh, at the top of the hour now. So uh, I think we need to adjourn. Um, but perhaps uh, already people can uh, follow up with you, with you um, after, offline with questions if people have additional questions. Yep, certainly. All right, great. Well, let's, uh, thank you very much again, Oli. That was a great talk. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.